morning, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me well. And welcome to Introduction to Heathland Habitats. Ben is just logging on and will be joining us shortly. So I'm Abby Maiden and I help coordinate the National Plant Monitoring Scheme in Northern Ireland. Throughout this webinar, um, Ben will be presenting his slide and telling you all about Heathland Habitats. But there is a question and answer function. So you can put any questions you want in there. If it's anything to do with the sound, not being able to see the stream or anything like that, I can obviously answer them as we go along any of the technical issues. But if there's any kind of questions I feel Ben will be best suited, we can get them all answered at the end. There'll be time for question and answers equally. You can put comments in the chat. If you want them just to come to myself and Ben, you can put them in and just to, to panelists. But if you want everyone else to see your comments, do select panelists and attendees. So just waiting on Ben here, he's having a bit of trouble logging in. And then when he's in, I'll obviously be quiet, log off my video, and then Ben will take over. But do at any point, if you have any questions, just pop them in and we'll cover them at the end. For anybody who um, would like to revisit this um, webinar at a later date or knows they have a meeting, say at half 10 and need to catch that, these webinars will be put on our MPMS YouTube channel where you can see, I do believe they go up the next day, but if it's not, just give it a few more days and they'll definitely be up. And you can rewatch it during uh, leisure. The annotated slides will also put it on the MPMS website on the online training. And you'll also have from the other sections such as the broadleaf woodlands that happened last week and also the training that went on the year before as well. Just while we're waiting for anybody interested, um, next week on the 18th, we'll be running the introduction to native pinewood and juniper scrub. And Ben is also running that presentation. And then on the 21st of May, we also have the introduction to lowland grassland habitats. And this is going to cover the fine scale habitat of dried acidic grasslands and dry heathland. And that will be done by Dominic Price. We're getting some lovely shout outs here from very different areas of the country, Devon and then Inverness. So welcome. It's glad to see so many people able to meet. I know not obviously in person, but all in one place. Good morning. I hope it's as sunny there as it is here on the north coast, in Northern Ireland. Some more from Heritage, Dublin, Essex, the Chilterns. Well, somebody's saying it's not sunny there. I'm sorry. Hopefully it's coming your way. Of cold and misty in the Shetlands. Well, maybe it'll warm up and well, it's not particularly warm here, but that's Ben in now. So I will just add him to Morning, Ben. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
Um, can you hear me at all? I can hear you now, Ben. Can you? Oh, good, good. Um, so that's yeah. I tried clicking the link, and it was taking me through to something that just wasn't wasn't doing it. So thanks, thanks for that link. Yeah, that's good. No, no problem. Glad you're here. Um, we've got lots of participations from all over the UK, but we've been discussing a bit of mixed weather across the UK. Yeah. Mm. So if you're happy enough, Ben, I can um, start sharing the presentation. Can you see that slide there? And if I move on to the next slide. Yep. That's that's good. That's good. Perfect. Um, well, everybody, I'll hand you over to Ben here now. Hello. Hello. Gosh. Quickly, just sort of got onto this thing. I've just been trying to log in for a few minutes and couldn't do it. And I was thinking, my God, what's going to what's going to happen? Anyway, I hope uh, hope you can all hear me clearly enough. Um, and so, I think Abby's going to um, move on from one slide to the next. Um, and, oh, somebody says we can hear you well. That's reassuring. <laughs> so you're sort of talking to screen here, and you don't know what's going on. Brilliant. That's the. Um, so yeah, what um, what we got here this morning is a kind of just a, a sort of illustrated tour through the um, the heathland habitat. Uh, interesting habitat, great great places, heaths, and um, it's sort of uh, having a look at the, the the habitat at the sort of plant community level. And um, oh, somebody says we can't see you though. Yeah, that's actually deliberate because. Um, you don't really want to see me do you know and also we did it before where i was appearing in a wee box in the corner problem was it takes up a bit of extra amount of the bandwidth i don't quite understand exactly what it's all about but what we found was that when we cut off my um video you could hear me better before then my voice was coming out kind of a bit um crackly or not, not really very good so that's why uh, you can't see me hmm. Um, yeah, um, a look through illustrated tour through these heaths, looking at it at the habitat level and also looking at a lot of the uh, species, the, the particular characteristic species that is good to know. Um, and someone says, I love heathlands. Yeah, they're a fantastic habitat. You know, I, I, somebody I know who's a very eminent ecologist once said, oh, heathland, not really my favourite habitat. I was quite amazed at that because um, this is somebody who, who knows all the special plants that we find. In these uh, in these heaths, and maybe it was the fact that there are a lot of them are quite species poor because they're in mostly sort of acid places, and you don't. I suppose uh, compared with some other habitats, it's not the place to go and really randomly expect kind of a lot of rarities. Maybe although you do get some pretty uncommon species in them. Anyway, yeah, they're a great habitat, and I like it that at least somebody here um, agrees. Um, and um, that all sort of sounds very happy. Let's do something miserable because I've written these this series of miserable habitat poems to begin these presentations with. And here's the one on heaths. It's, it's, it's misery, but with some, some fun in it, really. It's fun to be miserable sometimes. Okay, Heathland. Let's have a blether about the heather colouring the hills, pink and bright in summer light, or brown when winter chills. Its leaves are short, they're kind of sort of, don't know what to say, except they're small. I guess that's all I can think of just today. Some better, to, <clears throat> some better, to, excuse me, some better time, a light will shine and other thoughts may come. Blue sky stuff, off the cuff, making Heather fun. But here now, I can't think how. So Heather's little leaf is put aside for a boring guide to different kinds of heath. Written for those who, I suppose, leave happiness behind and choose to roam all alone with habitats on their mind. <clears throat> Someone says the sound is disappearing and coming back. Is it just me? Um, I don't know. Um, we've uh, done whatever I can do at my end um, by taking the, the, the video off. Um, it's coming through okay on my end, Dan. Yeah. So I'm not, a few other people have said sounds fine here. Sounds maybe it was that good perfect. for me. Mm -hmm. um, maybe hmm. all I could advise is obviously you guys don't have your video on, so it, you obviously can't turn that off. The other thing might be just to see if it continues and if it gets bad, it could potentially come out and then come back into the webinar again. Um, alternatively, if that doesn't fix it, 
and it's not ideal obviously here now but this will be on youtube in the next couple of days but hopefully like it gets a bit better and if not try coming in again on the webinar good um and thank you thanks uh good to see these comments um appearing i'm glad some of you like my poem uh if we go on to the next page we can begin to um to look at some of the sort of uh, details you might say so these um these these five species illustrated here are sort of um uh, important species to know when we're looking at the heaths and as I said right at the beginning there um, that for NPMS purposes this is habitats defined as um, vegetation in which at least a quarter of the vegetation cover is made up of any combination of that um, group of species there so um, they're, they're they're, they're obviously very important things to know and some of them you or maybe some of you know maybe all of them are known to many of you so heather as i've already said in that little poem heather's got very tiny leaves and very small flowers that's where you can tell it from um bell heather the next one to the right whose leaves are a lot longer um and they're in whorls of three on the bell heather and when the flowers are out the bell heather is quite distinct because it's um it's got darker sort of bright pink flowers quite distinct sort of plants and um, those those are both in fact all these species here are NPMS positive indicators in um, at least one of the um, subtypes of the um, heath and habitat type um, bilberry in the middle there quite different looking with those oval leaves that fall off in the um, autumn so it's deciduous um, little leaves with teeth around their edges and of course those edible berries. Um, always easy to identify at any time of year because the stems are, they're woody, but they're green and they've got those longitudinal ridges running down them, you can see in that photo. Um, nothing else really looks like that in terms of the stems except for broom, you know, bigger bush broom in a different family, totally different looking thing, although so you can get very small young rooms, uh, a bit of a look-alike for Heather, but the leaves are very different and um, yeah, uh, the, the bilberry is really quite distinctive. Um, cowberry is related to bilberry and it's got similar sized leaves, but they're evergreen, they're much darker and um, they don't have the teeth around the edges, or well, they might have a few very slight teeth, but the edges are a little bit enrolled underneath as well, so you, it kind of looks untoothed. And, um, it's it doesn't grow that tall really this cowberry um the bilberry can grow up to about a meter in some places as can the bell heather and the ordinary heather if they're not grazed um the bilberry and the bell heather and the heather are very palatable to animals like deer and sheep so they will be grazed down low if there's a lot of those animals about the cowberry and also the crowberry on the far right they're nothing like as palatable so um, even though they're not really eaten very much by those animals, they never grow very tall anyway. Um, so cowberry is pretty easy to identify. Crowberry on the right, it's kind of vaguely a bit like bell heather, but the leaves are thicker textured and um, they have a white stripe running along the underneath, which will always identify it. And they don't have those great loads of, um, of pink flowers that you get in the bell heather. The cowberry and the crowberry uh, plants of kind of generally more northern um, habitats, cooler, higher altitude further north uh, in heaths and they also grow in some other habitats as well like woods here and there. So that's an important um, load of plants. Funnily enough the uh, uh, bilberry in the middle I've just been using the English name. Last night I wrote a wee poem. I'm glad some of you like my little poem I said earlier. I've got one more. I just wrote it last night and then I promise you there won't be any more <clears throat> about bilberry because it's got different names. Bilberry is the usual name but people don't all speak the same. I don't know if you've ever heard that blaberry is our Scottish word. Perhaps you knew or maybe not. Anyway, we cook them hot in pastry, crumble, stuff like that, or eat them fresh, or squash them flat on paper just to make a mess. Work of art? Anyone's guess. Down in Devon, far away, whortleberry is what they say. It's not so far away for those who actually live there, I suppose. 
Everywhere's a different place, each of us a different face, different minds, different thoughts. I draw pictures, some play sports, different names for a shrub so small, the three I know might not be all. Okay, uh, should we move on to the next, um, <laughs> next slide? And here we see that um, this heathland habitat is divided into two fine scale um, habitats. And um, there's uh, one called dry heaths. And um, well, the, there's, um, uh, in fact, there's more about that on the, on, on the next subsequent pages. But um, this one is, is basically dry heaths. And it's handy to, at the early stage here, to um, oh, somebody's saying Wimberry. Ah, I thought there might be another name in the Welsh Valleys. <laughs> um, these, we've got dry heaths. Um, it's handy to understand from an early stage in this how to distinguish a dry heath from a wet heath and also, funnily enough, from a bog, because bogs can be just as heathy as um, wet heaths or dry heaths. And what we have is a um, a group of other species that we'll see um, when we go on to the next page in a wee while. Um, and it's very handy to keep those in mind when we're looking at any kind of heath vegetation, um, because the other group of species we're going to see soon are species of wetter places. And if we get a lot of those in there, then we're looking at wet heath or bog. And um, those other species are cross leaf heath, deer grass, purple moor grass. Um, cotton grasses and bog myrtle and um, dry heath which is the current habitat we're looking at in this presentation today has little or nothing in the way of that group of species um, if we do have those species in there plentifully then it's either wet heath or bog and we can distinguish which of those two it is by basically hare's tail cotton grass and certain species of sphagnum but that's not really for um for today um so we can um go on from here to the next page and see what that little group of species is that is handy to keep in mind that we don't want to be seeing too much of these if we're going to call the habitat the um, this current heathland habitat. So first is cross-leaved heath which is a bit like bell heather but its leaves are in whorls of four not three and they look a bit more of a greyish colour because they've uh, I think they actually are a bit of a greyish colour but also they've got little white hairs along the edges which from a bit of a distance makes them look a bit greyer anyway and um, the flowers are a paler colour and that likes kind of wet peaty places, wet heaths and bogs really. Deer grass is kind of sedge that grows in little tufts with very straight stems, they might look a bit like leaves at first but they're actually stems, each one with a very tiny little flower spike on top, little dull brown thing. Purple moor grass is a big tufted grass, very distinct with um, long flower heads that come up in the summer and the leaves are long and they get fairly wide and are at the middle and they narrow down to the base and they fall off in the winter and form a big mat of pale coloured, pale buff coloured sort of leaf litter between the tussocks. Very distinctive plant. Cotton grasses are two species, common cotton grass with um, multiple dangling down um, white cottony heads <clears throat> and um, oh, dangling down on one side and hair's tail cotton grass with a single upright cottony head. Um, hair's tail cotton grass has wiry leaves and a big dense tuft. Common cotton grass has broader leaves um, ending in a, a long sharp sort of thickened point. Quite distinctive plants. And bog myrtle on the right is like a kind of little willow. It's got slightly willowy like leaves and um, that if you crush them they have a beautiful resinous kind of smell and the twigs are rather reddish. So all of those are plants that we find um, in wet heaths and in bogs um, and in both the wet heaths and the bogs we can also find any of that first group of species we saw a couple of pages back heather bell heather blaberry um, cowberry etc they can all be in in there anyway that's why it's handy to know what these other species are um, for um, identifying the habitat as um, as dry heath or not um, Okay, so on the next page, we've got some we've got some questions because I've been informed that you folks like to have a few questions thrown at you. I'm not expecting you to actually answer these questions um, and provide answers before we move on because that would be a bit unfair and um, a bit stressful. So anyway, um, how do you tell Heather and Bell Heather apart is one just things to think about really, you know. 
what else might you confuse the bell heather with and how do you tell crowberry from bell heather um, and we can move on to the next page which has the answers so to those just these are just kind of reminders they're not really questions and answers just kind of reminding ourselves about something that we've seen yeah bell heather's leaves are longer and in those whorls um, compared with the heather and its flowers are bigger and darker and you be might confuse it with cross-leaved heath but that's got leaves that are grayer and in whorls of four and it's got those paler flowers um, and then crowberry has that white stripe running along the middle of the underside of the leaf. Um, it's a bit like a kind of white vein in a way, but funnily enough, it's um, apparently what it really is um, technically is that the dark colour on the underside of the leaf, the dark colour that surrounds each side of that white stripe is actually part of the upper side of the leaf that's been folded down underneath um, underneath it's like someone's tried to fold the two sides down and they haven't quite met and they've revealed a white stripe still visible along um, along the underside because they, they the dark things couldn't meet up i've tried looking at um, the underside of the leaves of um, of crowberry as close as i can under a, a hand lens trying to see if there's a bit of a I know structurally something a bit different along the edge where that white border is the green and it just looks absolutely flush you know they've made a very good job of, um, of folding it down and um, fooling us that uh, that it's not uh, upper side under two different surfaces one against the other okay let's let's go on to the next page another couple of questions yes how to separate dry heath from wet heath and what's this in the photo ordinary heather or bell heather or cross-leaved heath so um we can um you know people talk about white heather sometimes don't they um let's have a look at the next um the next page here and um there's the answer to those the dry heath doesn't have anything or hardly anything of those that group of species cross-leaved heath deer grass purple moor grass cotton grasses and bog myrtle um, whereas those species are common or at least one of them might be present um, in, in wet heath. The thing is in, with those species um, you might get a tiny bit of cross-leaf heath or deer grass or something in a dry heath but only very 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 sparse, no more than very sparse. In, in a wet heath or a bog you wouldn't expect to have every single one of that group of wet loving species. There might be only one of them but it'll be in bigger quantity and in significant quantity. Um, so, so, so it's treating them as a group, really. Um, and that thing with the white flowers was bell heather. The flowers are too big and too bunched up at the end for ordinary heather, and the leaves are too long for ordinary heather, and um, and they're not uh, with that greyish um, colour that we'd see in the cross-leaved heath. Okay, let's move on, and um, we can start looking on the next slide at some different kinds of plants, not dwarf shrubs. These are, these are common in the heathland um, MPMS habitat as, as a whole right throughout, because it's got these two, as we're gonna see soon, it's got these two sort of subdivisions, which we're gonna see on the next page. Um, uh, but these three species we can find very commonly throughout all kinds of, um, of, of dry heaths. Wavy hair grass on the left, it's one of these kind of grasses that's got um, very thin, wiry leaves. They're only no more than about a millimetre wide. So it's hard really to tell which is the upper surface and which is the lower surface when you look at a leaf so thin. Um, there's a number of, of um, grasses that have leaves as thin as that. And um, uh, this one is distinct from the other ones there in having this beautiful flower head that opens out into a widely branched sort of inflorescence there in which the individual branches are really thin and delicate and they can be quite wavy. <clears throat> uh, whether that's how it got its name or not, I'm not sure, because the whole flower head does wave about in the wind as well. Uh, the individual spikelets there in the flower head are relatively large. There's not that many of them and they've got a nice silvery sort of sheen. Um, we can confuse the leaves of wavy hair grass with um, fescues but uh, the sheep's fescue and the red fescue but they've got a, a minutely short ligule whereas in the wavy hair grass the ligule is just a bit longer up to about three millimeters that's one of the differences if you haven't got the flowers on that is 
Uh, Tormental, pretty um, easy plant to tell, especially when it's in flower, those four petaled yellow flowers. <clears throat> Sometimes you get one with five petals, not very often. Uh, leaves are in, um, they're trefoil leaves, so you have three leaflets, but you can also get two little stipules that look like miniature leaflets down at the um, base as well. So, um, uh, but the leaflets are quite distinct. They're a dark colour and they've got these little jaggy teeth in the, in the sort of towards the end of the leaflets, not that many of them. And they've got a quite, quite a firm sort of texture. They go brown in the winter. Even when they're brown, you can um, generally identify them and they can persist reasonably well into the winter. Heath bed straw, um, creeping little bed straw with leaves in well, worlds of up to eight. The young growth tends to have only about four. Flowering stems, that's when you start getting more, leave, more leaves to a whirl. Um, it's got a very smooth feel to it compared to some other bed straws that have rather a rough texture. The ones with the rougher texture uh, have got these little tiny prickly hairs that point backwards, either on the leaves or on the leaves and the stems. On the heath bed straw, the stems don't have leaves, don't, sorry, don't have leaves, the stems don't have hairs. The leaves do have little tiny hairs on their edges, but they point forwards. <clears throat> this gives the whole plant a very smooth feel to the touch. And if you're out and about in heathery places and you see a bed straw growing on the ground, um, then it's, <clears throat> it's pretty much the only bed straw you're likely to find is the heath bed straw. Um, and going back to the tormentor, when I was saying that its leaves can persist quite well into the winter, as actually can the leaves of the heath bed straw, this is one of the good things about heaths, that um, it's a habitat in which most of the vascular plant growth which obviously comes up in the summer and spring and summer and flowers in that time of year and then sort of dies down, um, a lot of this herbaceous growth persists quite well. It's got enough of a tough texture to remain quite well into, into the winter. That contrasts with some habitats like uh, habitats on very nutrient rich soils in the lowlands where stuff shoots up in the summer and dies back. <clears throat> so it's sort of virtually nothing in the winter. And you can go there in the winter and there's a lot of bearish ground. You think what's going on here. Um, so in, um, in heaths, you can classify the vegetation pretty well all times of the year. I'm saying that only a few days ago, my wife and I were working up in Aberdeenshire for nine days of field work on um, large, largely on heaths. We were able to classify the vegetation with no problem using the National Vegetation Classification System at this time of year. And it's like winter up there. <clears throat> OK, let's go on to the next page and um, we'll see now about the two what they call fine scale habitats. Although actually each of these, it's not quite that fine. It's not like really fiddly difficult details because they're quite broad. Basically, these two sub subdivisions in the heathland habitat are um, one that's montane, that's the second one, and the other one that is not montane, which is the great bulk of it. So the first one called dry heathland um, is, uh, is almost all the heath that most people <coughs> will have seen. It's not just in the lowlands, it's, it's actually more extensive in the uplands of Britain. Um, the montane um, subtype is much more restricted in its distribution because montane, what we mean by montane is really places where the climate is very, very harsh. Um, like it's not, not really very good for trees to grow. Um, and it's really quite a specific term is montane. So we're talking usually about much higher, higher up, although when you go into the far northwest, you can find um, montane habitats um, as determined by the vegetation coming down quite low because the, um, the far northwestern seaboard and places like Shetland and the Outer Hebrides, so windy and the summers don't get very hot. So um, montane habitats can come down in some places really very low in those parts of the country. <clears throat> Um, excuse me, coughing is talking and um, sometimes gets to your throat, you know. Anyway, first we can go, if we go on to the next page, uh, we can um, take a quick look, well, reasonably quick look, first at the main habitat, what's called the dry heathland fine scale habitat, because that's the one that's um, most extensive in this country. Um, looking at the species and the sort of um, the vegetation types. And then we'll go on and do the same for the montane subtype. 
And um, we've seen a few of these species, we've seen some of the main species already in these last few slides, but it's handy to, um, to remind ourselves about here about heather, bell heather and bilberry. Um, because not just because they're so common, but also because of their ecology. Heather can grow right across the range of um, non-montane dry heaths. Bell heather and bilberry are slightly more restricted. They're very common, each of them very common. But bell heather has a preference for places that are a bit warmer, a bit better lit. It's an oceanic species on a European scale. It doesn't like things to get too cold. It doesn't like a lot of snow either. Uh, bilberry, on the other hand, uh, it will extend much further east into the continent and it can put up with a lot of cold and a lot of snow. And what we often find in heaths is that a south facing slope uh, with fairly dry soils gets a nice lot of sun and warmth. Bell heather can do very well there. And if we go around onto a north facing slope, very typically um, on average, you know, bell heather tends to fizzle out and the bilberry becomes more commoner there in those cooler places. And that's why we all have our own personal um, approaches to things. And heaths that have a lot of bell heather, I tend to think of them as warm heaths. Those that have a lot of bilberry, I tend to think of them as cool heaths. That's why I've written bell heather in a nice warm pinky color, which is the color of its flowers. And I've written bilberry in a green color, which is, I suppose, a cooler color. I could have written it in blue, but I don't know, could get into all kinds of discussion about these things. Anyway, let's, <laughs> let's move on to um, the next page, which has got a, a photo of each of those two types. These are heaths with um, a lot of heather in them. Heather is dominant, actually, in both of these examples of dry heath. One on the top has got a lot of bell heather. That's my warm heath. Um, the one at the bottom has a lot of uh, bilberry. I can't see any bell heather in it. Kugler Heath, probably in a rather cool, it is in a cooler place, it's higher up um, and it's on a slope that's, um, that's facing east, it's a rather cooler aspect than southwest. <clears throat> so, uh, on the next page, we can see um, one that's got a that's sort of in between. It's a lot of heather, but there's also um, bilberry and bell heather. We do find this. Depending on the slope aspect, sometimes you can be just at the at the edge where it's sort of uh, on a particular aspect, like southeast maybe, um, or depending on the dryness of the um, of the soils, all sorts of things where you are, how what the climate's like. You can get heather mixed with equal amounts of bell heather and blaeberry, sort of a halfway stage. But in general, right through the dry heaths of um, of Britain and Ireland. Um, we can generally place ourselves somewhere on this gradient of variation from heather with bell heather through to heather with um, bilberry. Um, and it's, uh, the, more, the further west you go, you tend to find more of the bell heather. And if you want to find heaths with a lot of bilberry in them, your, your um, better chance is going further east or higher up, as a general rule. Okay, um, if we go on to the next page. Oh, just taking a slurp of coffee here, excuse me. Um, and um, there's uh, another sort of, there are other areas, other kinds of variation across this range of dry heats um, from um, warmer to cooler, more generally, not so much west to east, but more kind of north to south. Uh, we've already seen the um, cowberry and the crowberry, and I did mention that they're kind of things that are species that are like a bit cooler, higher up, further north. Um, and uh, so the more the more higher altitude and more northern examples of the dry heathland um, sub habitat that we're in now, they they can be common there. And not surprisingly, they also go into the montane ones as well. Um, on the other hand, down south we can get um, another different group of species, uh, gorses, particular kinds of gorse. The ordinary gorse, Ulex europaeus, is common throughout Britain. And it can grow in heaths, in dry heaths, <clears throat> all over the place, though not to, a, not to a very great altitude. But um, further south, we can find the, um, the western gorse and the dwarf gorse. And um, 
the Western course has a generally Western distribution up as far as Southern Scotland and um, Northern Ireland. And the, as, as a native anyway, the dwarf course is much more confined to the far south, but there's an isolated population in um, the, in North Cumbria, oddly enough, for that. Uh, we can see some closer pictures of these on the, on the next page, actually. There's the three courses, the common ordinary course on the left, and the Western course and the dwarf course. To the right, they 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 grow. The Western gorse and the dwarf gorse grow not as tall as the ordinary gorse, but that's not always much help because the ordinary gorse it might be grazed, it might just be young growth. So height, um, they, there's a lot of overlap. Uh, Western gorse can grow up to a couple of meters. You know, it can be quite quite high. Um, Western gorse and dwarf gorse tend to have rather smaller leaves. Um, there are various differences in the, um, in the flowers as well. Generally, they're a bit sort of scaled down in various, um, in various ways. Um, and their leaves are not quite as a, so much of a greyish green and not quite so deeply grooved as the leaves of the ordinary gorse. I think that maybe you could say they're not quite so, quite so prickly, but I wouldn't go um, marching into a, a whole uh, a lot of western gorse very confidently on that score so um on the next page we've got so the next few pages we, we've got some um pictures of examples of these southern heaths that include these smaller species of gorse they're lovely things to have in heaths because when they're in flower which is late summer they're quite specifically late summer to early autumn flowering as opposed to the ordinary gorse which is also which is starting to flower now which has been in flower for a while um, flowers much wider time of year these these other ones in the late summer that flowering um, overlaps with the flowering of the heather and the bell heather so you get this beautiful mix of colors it's a particular characteristic feature of these southern heaths um, uh, oh someone's asking about that coconutty scent I don't know, I can't remember. The ordinary gorse has a beautiful coconut smell. It's absolutely fantastic. And I've just been wondering the other day when walking up the road from here and smelling it, thinking, do you get the same with the Western gorse and the dwarf gorse? On the times that I've seen the Western gorse, which is quite a few times, and, um, and I, I've, I've just not had it, uh, my wits about me to, to test it and smell. Someone's saying they think it's only the common one. Yeah, oh well. See, there's something good. I mean, it's great to see these other gorses in these heaths. And you think, wow, what we're missing here up in up in the north. But if we're the only, if the if it's only the common gorse that has that smell, it is amazing smell. Yeah. So um, thanks for that comment about that. Uh, so this is a beautiful one of this this sort of mixed yellow and pinky purple, more more kind of southern heath with western gorse. The the next um, page has some kind of some kind of similarity in that we've got western gorse in uh, in fact there's an awful lot of western gorse there it's not quite at its um optimum flowering time <clears throat> it's quite way off its optimum flowering time as you can see it's hardly any flowers um but there is some um, heather and bell heather sort of tucked away there you can see flowers of bell heather there's also cross leaf teeth you can see the paler colors of that this is an example where um, it's so strongly dominated by the Western gorse that the rest of the flora is a bit watered down and we had to hunt around in there a bit to decide, are we first to decide, are we gonna call this a dry heath or a wet heath? Because the Western gorse um, can also grow in wet heaths. So um, we look out, we keep a lookout for cross-leaved heath, purple moorgrass, you know, those wetter looking species. And indeed, in this place, there is cross-leaved heath and you can see the long leaves of the purple moorgrass. Um, they're quite sparse. So um, it's kind of got elements of both drier and the, and the wetter heath. Um, everything watered down because there's so much of the, um, of the Western gorse. Um, next picture has um, also got Western Gorse in it, although on the picture on the left, you can't really see it that clearly because it's not flowering for one thing, and it's rather on the sparser side. And um, uh, nothing's really flowering there. 
But uh, what there is in both these pictures, which were taken, I took them on um, Exmoor, uh, is that when we're down in that far southwest, there's a uh, kind of grass that you get in these heaths, bristle bent across this courtesy eye. It's got a very markedly southwestern distribution. It's basically southwest England and kind of just into south, you could call it south central England. Uh, and in the extreme south of Wales as well. And it's a very tough to thing. It looks a bit like wavy hair grass, except the leaves are a bit of a greyer tinge and they're stiffer. And the flower head is more like the ordinary agrostis, the bent grasses, and it's just got lots of branching and the individual little um, flowers are very, very small. Um, but it doesn't kind of open out quite as wide, really, as your typical bent grass flower head. It tends to stay rather narrow. Um, so that's a, a species we find in both dry heaths and wet heaths, actually, in the um, in the far southwest. That's another um, thing to bear in mind when we're looking at geographical variation from north to south in these heaths. The next picture has a, um, a, a close view of um, some of the dwarf course. This is down in Berkshire. I was there a few years ago doing some um, NVC teaching with some people and um, made the most of uh, being in a place with dwarf course because I'd hardly ever seen that species uh, apart from the North Cumbria population. And here it is with a few flowers on its and growing with, with bell heather in some relatively, you could say, yeah, warm, dry heath. And on the next page, it's the same place and it's got uh, ordinary heather growing in there as well. Kind of looks a bit dull. The only thing flowering is the bell heather. It was rather parched, it was a very hot summer. But these are examples of southern kind of dry heath with the um, heather and bell heather, no bilberry. And um, it's not a, not a, a cool heath. And with the uh, dwarf, course mixed in. So um, that's a quick whiz through uh, some of those uh, more more southern heaths. And the next page questions again. It's uh, we're asking how would you put these in, in, in a kind of order of thermophily as in uh, which you know liking it warm or like you know being able to take it cold. Um, the most um, the most cold tolerant or the most warmth demanding, bell heather, bilberry, western gorse, and and, um, and cowberry. And uh, the next page will put them in the right order. Cowberry is the most cold tolerant. You're not going to see cowberry in that place in Berkshire, for example. Um, bilberry. Next one down um, is, and then bell heather is liking it a bit warmer, and the western gorse definitely um, needing some more warmth. And of course, the dwarf gorse would be further would be down at the bottom of that list. That would need it even more warm. Okay, um, we can go to the next picture. And here, um, this is a bit different, in that we've got sphagnum. You know how people. Um, recognize sphagnum quite rightly as a group of mosses that uh, that like rather wet conditions so you get sphagnum in bogs and in all kinds of rush mires sedge mires and so on but there are lots of different kinds of sphagnum some of them really need those very wet conditions like sphagnum cuspidatum for example in bog pools um, but then others like this the red one here sphagnum capillifolium can be in places that are rather better drained, even on quite steep slopes. Um, they can also grow in bogs, this species can grow in bogs as well, but, um, but it can occur um, on, on sloping ground where, yeah, there's quite reasonably free drainage. But if the slope faces more or less north, and if you're in an area where you get quite a lot of rain in the uplands, then um, you can just get a kind of humid enough microclimate, humid atmosphere and so on, that keeps the ground wet enough um, and the air moist enough for that sphagnum capillifolium to grow quite happily. Um, or to grow at all. It's not as if it would grow unhappily on a dry south facing slope, it just wouldn't grow there really. So um, you can get a lot of sphagnum in, in this place where, 
in a, um, a sort of among a canopy of heather, maybe with some bilberry, um, maybe some cowberry as well. Um, but without the um, the other species like the purple moorgrass, the deer grass, the cross leaved heath, of course you can find the this red sphagnum in with those wetland species as well in bogs and wet heaths. But yeah, it can. Um, sort of maintain itself quite well in a north facing heath that doesn't have those. The result of that is that we have a heather dominated heath um, with a lot of sphagnum, these red patches of sphagnum papillifolium, and we have to call this a dry heath as opposed to a wet heath because of the lack of deer grass, purple moor grass and so on. Um, and funnily enough you can you can get, um, uh, as I've uh, discussed, I think, on the next page, although well, I've not illustrated this particular point, but um, it's an interesting thing that in some of those dry heather dominated heaths with that red sphagnum moss, that sphagnum can be really extensive on the ground. There's a place actually not far from here, one of many examples, where it's virtually 100% cover carpet of this um, red sphagnum underneath the heather, but it's still not even a wet heath, let alone a bog. And then you can find some, um, some wet heaths and even some bogs where your total sphagnum cover in the same amount of area of ground is less than that. So um, one, I suppose, lesson from that is don't, don't um, use sphagnum in the simple total, just broad sense of, of sphagnum, the genus, as um, an indicator of any particular habitat, even at a broad level. It's not like, oh, it's got sphagnum in it, so it must be a bog, but it could be a wet heath and it could even be a dry heath. Um, okay, oh, and the other thing I'd mentioned here was that in this particular kind of heath, that's a, basically a dry heath, but has the sphagnum in it because it's facing north to northeast um, or north to east, and it's in an upland area with quite a lot of rain, that in those sorts of places, especially in the far west highlands in the west of Ireland, uh, where it's really rainy, we can get an amazing assemblage of um, uncommon leafy liverworts growing in, in the heath there, all different colours, beautiful plants, um, species of Herbertus and Anastrophilum and things, and some pictures, close-ups of them just at the bottom of this page. They're beautiful plants, they're quite uncommon, but these are one of the really special things that, um, that we can find in these heaths. I know that mosses and liverworts aren't um, part of the NPMS, officially speaking but you know if you find some a thing a species around that are of interest it does make a big difference and actually in the term in terms of a, say a general assessment of what that heath's about and how special it is um, in the west highlands we would very much be keeping our eyes open for um, mosses and liverworts and lichens as well especially in the north and the northeast the lichens play a big role in some of these heaths um, so yeah, these are beautiful plants and some of them are, are, are very disjunct in their distributions around the world. The ecological links with places like the Himalayas and British Columbia um, can be seen among some of our northwestern heaths. Okay, uh, let's go on to the next picture. It gives me time for another quick slurp of coffee, which is getting a bit cool. Uh, slightly lukewarm coffee. Never mind. Um, so coastal heaths. Um, interesting um, heaths we get along some of the coasts, especially as some of them can have um, maritime species in them, like thrift and these plantains. And um, if we're using something like, if we're using the national vegetation classification, we'd be using different, so we put these into different classes, H7 and H11. Um, but uh, we're not doing that here, but we can still recognize the, um, <clears throat> these little differences that we, that we do get some specific kinds of heath with maritime species in them. We things like the thrift and the plantains, if we're on a kind of mineral soil, firmish mineral soil, uh, or um, sand sedge, if we're on a kind of looser sandy soil, like a sand dune heath really. Um, <clears throat> the sand dune heath's not really very common. Uh, not, not quite as, not really as common and widespread as the, um, the other one the, uh, on the left that we get on the mineral soils. So always interesting kinds of heaths to um, come across these ones. Um, among the dwarf shrubs, 
that we find in these really coastal heaths, um, obviously heather is there, typically it's dominant, bell heather can be very, very common, you can get some crowberry in some of them. Um, bilberry, for a species that's so common in heaths generally, bilberry is surprisingly rare in the really coastal heaths. So um, uh, now let's go on to the next picture here and um, the, um, we've, we've seen geographical variation from coasts to hillsides, north facing, <clears throat> south facing, cooler, warmer and so on. Those are all natural, physical features of various kinds that are having their effect on the um, makeup of the heath vegetation. <clears throat> Superimposed onto all that, we've got some um, things people have done. Uh, well, indirectly, people haven't been eating the heather, but it's the animals that have sheep and deer, for example. And the more grazing you have in these places, the more the tendency for the dwarf shrub cover to be reduced and for grasses or grasses and sedges in some places to, um, to have more space and to grow better. And so you end up with a more grassy kind of heath. This is an example here. Uh, it's actually quite uh, quite lush growth in this particular picture. The grasses are flowering well, they're quite tall. Um, and, and so the dwarf shrubs, it looks like maybe it's been grazed hard down a bit more in the past and then at least maybe for a year or a few years since then has been allowed to um, grow a bit more freely with rather less grazing. Um, so it's also um, handy to remember when you, we're looking at these places, not just that grassy heaths are probably more grazed, but that um, it's not every kind of dwarf shrub species that is very palatable to the, um, those animals. Heather and bell heather and bilberry, as I mentioned earlier on, are really very palatable. Um, funny because they've got these woody stems, you might think the animals would prefer to eat grass and small herbs like tormentil and heath bed straw. But no, they, they, they will go for these, um, these woody shrubs big time, really, especially the, the bilberry. You know, it's got these green, we can't see bilberry in this picture, it's not there, but bilberry, we had, remember that earlier picture, had those green stems, um, green longitudinally ridged stems. So there's sort of chlorophyll in there and it's a good bite for them to eat all through, through the winter. Sometimes in the, in the winter, if you've got some bilberry around, it's one of the few green elements of vascular plant vegetation. Um, and in some heaths you can get um, reasonably tall heather and you can get bilberry growing in there as well but you can see the animals have focused in, homed in on that bilberry and browsed it down really low because the heather could be maybe up to about 60-70 centimetres and little tiny sprigs of bilberry about 10 or 15 centimetres hidden away among them. Um, so um, Someone's asking, do they contain higher levels of sugar, which makes them tastier than grass? I don't know. I think um, uh, one, one thing is that they, um, they are there through the winter and the, um, they're evergreen in the sense that the heather and the bell heather are, are, are evergreen. So the stuff they're foliage to eat when other things have died down. And although the bilberry leaves have fallen off, its stems um, will still be reasonably palatable. But I don't know, that's an interesting question about, um, about sugars. Uh, if we go to the next picture, we see an example of um, the other major um, thing that people do um, in dry heaths, which is burning, mainly for grass moor management, uh, which of course has been coming under public scrutiny quite a lot of late, quite rightly, because it has pretty, um, pretty severe effects on the whole habitat really, suddenly burning away in patches, sharp, unnaturally edged um, patches, these burning away the heather canopy, um, exposing peace if it's a very severe burn. Um, and yeah, interfering with the natural processes of, um, of heather growth. The heather does tend to grow back, depending on um, how much grazing there is, though it can convert some bits, at least temporarily, to a kind of um, heathy, more, more grassy heath, or even um, an area of grassland. And it's not very good news for certain species that are very sensitive to fire, uh, like um, 
juniper, especially in the more montane heath, junipers and bearberries and things, and more the Arctic bearberry. And mosses and liverworts, many species of mosses and liverworts in, in the damper heaths, um, they, they don't do very well, or they can be just sort of um, ousted out really, frazzled out, burnt out when, um, when this management takes place. This is sort of patch burning that we see a picture of here for grouse moor management. You get also um, in some places, bigger solid burns where they're not maybe not doing it for grass moor management but doing it because they reckon that it might be better for sheep grazing that you get the younger growth of heather that sheep will prefer and you can get some big spreads of ground um, burnt all in a one um, a bit of a risky thing really when when it's if it's in the west and it's anywhere near where there's north facing slopes where they might get some of those special liverworts where um, the liverworts that wouldn't tolerate the burning always a bit of a worry. So that's another thing that happens in these heaths. Okay, if we go on to the next um, page, we've got a few more um, vascular plant species, three more. The, you know, these aren't the most species rich habitats for their vascular plant species. They're not like calcareous grasslands, you know, where you can get loads, you wouldn't know where to stop really for, for illustrating herbs and things. Anyway, heath spotted orchid, very, very, very common in a lot of these dry heaths and in wet heaths too. Um, quite distinctive with that little pale pink flat topped um, spike of flowers. And um, petty wind in some places we find like in Eastern Scotland here, there's a lot of it in many of the dry heaths, it's like a miniature kind of gorse or a miniature broom. It's got spines on it. it looks very innocent, but it's, um, you have to watch out for those wee spines. Um, it flowers quite early as well. It's flowering already up here. Uh, heath milkwort, it's a lovely thing with these bluish or purpley blue little flowers. Leaves, at least the lower ones, are in opposite pairs. That's one way you can tell it from common milkwort. milkwort. But if you find any kind of milkwort growing in a heath with heather or heathery plants, it's going to be this species because the common milkwort is really a plant of um, uh, places where the soil is not acid, more kind of neutral to basic, like uh, calcareous grassland, for example. Um, so uh, heath milkwort, by far the commonest milkworts in the heaths, and one of, one of our commoner herbs in such places, along with tormentil and heath bed straw and so on. Okay, um, that's uh, going on to the next picture, and we're moving on, moving up to the other fine scale habitat. Um, the, the dry montane heathland. Quite good fun fiddling about with the font size, making a mountain. <laughs> the, the, the word in the word processor. Um, so uh, as I said before, these are much less widespread and extensive. There, um, and if in fact, if you're anywhere south of the Scottish Highlands, then. Montane heath is a rare thing to find. And even in the Scottish Highlands, it's always an exciting thing to find. There are some places where you get higher up and there's good extents of it. Um, and some places where you can find it surprisingly low down in the far northwest. Um, but yeah, it's always an exciting thing because it's, it's um, for example, a lot of them are more natural. These are in places where the climate is too harsh for people to go doing a load of stuff like burning for grass mold management or, um, or where, where there's, um, uh, you can't, well, trees really won't grow very much, if at all, in most of our montane heath. And you're not gonna get things like conifer planting, uh, conifer plantations in such places. So on the whole, natural processes can be seen to be playing a pretty important role more obviously um, important role in these places, less interfered with. Grazing, there's a lot of grazing in some of these places, um, associated trampling that goes with it, and sometimes a bit of eutrophication. Um, but um, yeah, on the whole, there's still usually some excitement to be found among these montane heats. And um, there's some pictures there, there's some one with a lot of with bits of heather and even bell heather in it. Bell heather can get up into some of the montane zone. Um, and that one's in Sutherland. And then there's a picture on the right of a sort of uh, bilberry and uh, crowberry type of heath high up in Perthshire. Um, 
the um, <clears throat> there's a uh, one one can um, ask about one can wonder you know what what is the kind of variation that we can get in the dwarf shrub canopy as I've sort of said there in that coloured writing that um, these these kind of montane heaths can show um, variation in the dwarf shrub canopy from one thing to another and if we go on to the next page um, which we will barely need to really for me to give you the answer because you probably figured it out or it's obvious that uh, especially as I coloured the writing in relevant colours from the the ones that have been a lot of heather to the ones that are more bilberry, cowberry and crowberry, um, which are the greener coloured heaths. Um, and it's not just that some are more heathery and some are less heathery, there's some kind of um, significance to this ecologically in their, in their distributions. One of the things that makes these montane heaths such fascinating places, the montane heaths that are um, where the main dwarf shrub is heather, <clears throat> a lot of those tend to be in habitats that are very exposed to the wind. And the heather has remarkable tolerance of wind, as we can see by this picture here. Um, the wind's sort of preventing it from growing very tall. It's just sort of creeping along the ground, uh, uh, almost just about horizontally, <clears throat> rather patchy in its, uh, in its cover, patches of rachmitrium moss, that greyish coloured moss growing with it there. Um, amazing habitats, and there's quite a lot of space there between the plants and the moss patches, and we can get some montane plant species occupying that space. Montane plant species that can't tolerate competition from others, but in places like this, they do get that bit more space. And if they can tolerate the, um, the severe climate, they can grow there. Um, so that's um, one of the main ways, main forms of um, heather dominated heath is in these very uh, wind exposed sorts of places. Um, so heather's remarkably tolerant there. And if we go on to the next picture, we can see though that it does have limits. Yeah, it's, uh, if, if you start getting a lot of snow in the mix of things, then the heather is going to say no. It's not very tolerant of, um, <clears throat> of, of snow, long snow lie. Uh, whereas the bilberry um, and the crowberry and the cowberry, much more tolerant of that. So as you go further upslope, generally to the, the very highest ground where you're going to get more snow, or if you're in wee little kind of um, slight hollows where snow is going to collect and last longer, even if you, you might be within the zone where there's a lot of heather, but a little kind of hollow that collects a lot more snow, then in those places we can find that the, um, the heather can fizzle out and we get those greener bits of montane heath with bilberry, cowberry, crowberry. Yeah. <coughs> so there's a relationship with snow. Um, and um, there's some illustrations there. The one on the left is a place where you've got heather dominated heath roundabouts, and then this is a, a view within quite a small area of the more snowbed type heath. The one on the right is just generally higher up, so we've lost the heather. Everything is just generally too cold um, for the heather. Um, and as I mentioned in the text, it's a funny thing that you can be on a very, um, like a very windswept ridge somewhere and you can have the sort of very short heather dominated montane heath. And then it might be that just upslope, it gets that bit more sheltered and you're still not, not quite high enough for everything to be montane. So you're in an overlap zone and you can go slightly upslope from that um, windswept heath into back into an ordinary dry heath that's not montane. Oddly enough, that, that, that can happen. So there's a bit of overlap. There's a, like an overlap zone <coughs> between montane and not montane. And within that zone, it's the topographic variation that will um, affect whether you get more of a montane influence or less of, of such an influence. So next picture has another example of the short windswept uh, heather dominated heath and this one is in Sutherland but it's a bit further east than where the last one was taken and what happens is that the further east we go in these northern windswept um, cold heaths 
uh, and heaths in general, in fact, in the far north, the further east we go from the western seaboard, we tend to get less of that grey coloured rachimitrium moss and correspondingly a greater amount of these little lichens, these sort of pale creamy coloured lichens of the genus Cladonia. Um, and that uh, is a kind of ecological link with uh, Scandinavia, where in more kind of border parts of the world where these lichens feature in a very big way in heaths and in forest vegetation as well, actually. So that's um, an example of a, a northern one with, with a sort of Coluna cladonia heath there. And on the next page, we've got a few little plants um montane species because the species we've been seeing so far still being the ones that in themselves aren't strictly montane but just seeing how they behave in the montane environments here we've got some species that are themselves more montane the species that will occupy those niches there where they're not getting out competed by other plants some of these species could grow lower down um and you can even some you know some of them will grow like in a garden if we do the weeding out and make sure they've got enough space um, but uh, in the wild, um, it needs nature to do that <laughs> effectively and montane habitats, it's, um, it's okay for them to grow in because of that. So stiff sedge on the left, um, quite a wee little sedge, very stiff stems that are relatively thick and three angled, markedly three angled, you can see those um, that angling there. Um, otherwise it looks a little bit like carnation sedge um, or green rib sedge little bit. Its leaves are rather greyish like carnation sedge but it's got an acute um, the pointed sort of ligule. A nice little plant, very very quite common in some of the montane heaths and montane grasslands and montane snowbeds, quite a range of habitats. Uh, the same is true of the least willow, Salix herbacea, a tiny little willow with rather round leaves, about the same size as the leaves of the bilberry, but um, on the whole a bit more rounded and quite distinct teeth and a tendency for the left and right sides of the leaf to kind of slightly fold up um, into forming a kind of valley in the middle. Um, and it's got uh, quite a sort of slightly wrinkled texture to its upper leaf surface. Um, that can grow in amongst exposed sort of stones or cracks in slabs of rocks and things. Um, and quite a, quite a range of habitats, even in snowbeds as well. Um, so the, especially those very wind exposed heaths growing amongst the, um, the low growths of the heather. Uh, we can find the Salix herbacea. Trailing azalea can grow in the same sort of places as well. That really is one of its main habitats is these very high up um, exposed heaths where the vegetation is very, very short. Uh, it looks a bit like um, the crowberry, the ampetrum. You can see that leaf shape a little bit like that, except it's got a more distinct vein, central vein cut in, in a kind of groove running along the um, center of the, of, the, of the upper leaf surface. And when you look underneath, which obviously we can't because it's just a photograph, but um, it's paler but you don't get that white stripe that you get in the crowberry. So you'll never have difficulty telling um, trailing azalea leaves from crowberry leaves, even without the flowers. But here in this photo, we're lucky enough to see, and you may be in the field likewise, to see at certain times of year, these amazing little bright pink flowers. It's related to rhododendron. Uh, Alpine ladies mantle, easily distinguished from all other ladies mantles, which there are many by the leaves being cut into separate leaflets, cut right down, um, <clears throat> yeah, so deep that they're leaflets rather than lobes. And the underside of the leaf is a beautiful, sort of pale silvery color. And that silvery color extends out and around the edges. So when we look even from above, as we're doing here, uh, we see a kind of um, like a fine detailed uh, pale lining, outlining to each of the leaflets. So you never mistake that really for anything else, that, that species. And it's, it's quite common in the montane zone um, in the Scottish Highlands. It also grows in the Lake District. Um, in the Highlands, it's not just in heaths, it's also in grasslands and um, montane cliff habitats, quite a range of habitats. Um, the next page has a few um, dwarf shrubs of the um, montane heath kind of habitats. 
dwarf juniper. Its leaves are a bit like the leaves of ordinary juniper, except they tend to be not quite so sharply pointed, prickly. Um, it's a subspecies of it, of the juniper. But the plant as a whole is quite different because it's, it's very low, sort of creeping against the ground. And that's really quite a feature in some of these um, montane heaths. It's not very common. And if you find a montane heath or any, any vegetation actually in which dwarf juniper is common, <clears throat> you're looking at a pretty special place. It's very sensitive to fire, is the dwarf juniper. That's why some places where we find it, um, in not just in montane heaths, it can occur in some of the more windswept non-montane heaths as well. Wherever we find it, it's, it's a common thing to find that there's maybe a lot of rocks around and that it seems that if there was ever some burning going on there, maybe localised rockiness had helped the juniper because it had prevented the fire from getting absolutely everywhere because it formed gaps in its big slabs, slabs of rock. And, um, and the juniper can be tucked away in them, some of the more rocky parts of these heaths. <clears throat> Bearberry, the um, next one there, that's quite different. Funnily enough, it's, it's a creeping, low creeping shrub. Because of that, it's got limited tolerance to some things that will grow bigger and thicker, like heather. So um, in places where there's burning for grass moor management, the bearberry in, um, can actually benefit for, at least for a few years after a burn because the heather is reduced in its height and its cover. Um, and if you're in an area where bearberry grows, which is mainly in Scottish Highlands, um, then um, you can get a temporary increased abundance of it and you can get a heath that's co-dominated by bearberry and heather. Uh, some people might think, oh, well, maybe in some places we need some burning to look after, help look after the bearberry. But I think we have to be careful with that kind of way of thinking because that's making, um, imposing an unnatural and pretty severe regime to vegetation um, <clears throat> to do that. And it's not as if we really need to because the bearberry is holding its own anyway in other places that, um, that where, where the heather, um, is a bit more controlled naturally by things like wind in some of the more um, exposed heaths or by rockiness in some very rocky uh, places like some, some of the heaths on, um, on, on and among cliffs or screes, various things. Uh, so rockiness and wind um, do give us naturally sort of uh, good amounts of bearberry anyway in places where it's not burnt. Arctic bearberry is a much scarcer thing, uh, a very special thing to find. It's a northern plant we find in some places in the highlands, especially in the short montane heaths. And um, amazing thing is to see it in the autumn when the leaves turn seriously bright red. It's to, easy to tell because it's got those that kind of wrinkled texture to the upper leaf surface and the leaves taper very gradually down to their bases. Very distinctive plant thing to look out for if you're in these montane heaths in the north, uh, uh, from, and especially you know, for, the, for the northern highlands where you see most of it. Bog bilberry is scattered through um, mainly in the highlands here and there. Uh, for, well, it's rare, very rare further south. Um, and mainly in heaths, but you also do find it in some bogs. I suppose so the name bog bilberry, you might think is mainly in bogs, but it's on the whole more in heaths than in bogs. Um, leaves are a bit like bilberry, but they're not toothed around the edges. Um, they do fall off in the winter. Um, but they're a glaucous colour, pale, more of a bluey green colour. And um, some of the leaves are widest, slightly beyond the middle, which gives them a rather, rather different look. And stems are kind of more rounded and browner. So um, you not, you're not really going to mistake that for ordinary bilberry, nor you can not, you're not going to mistake it, mistake it for cowberry. Someone's asking, how do you tell bearberry from, oh, from cowberry? Yeah, they can look quite similar, but the cowberry is not so creeping and <clears throat> its leaves are more enrolled um, around, around the edges and a bit blunt or tipped. Um, the main main things to look out for, and the, the bearberry can form absolute sort of low mats. It's, um, it's, it's it has got quite a, quite a different look to it. It's a neater neater looking leaf. Um, 
with that um, it's more kind of much more flat sort of leaf that's not enrolled around the edges. But the, both the two species can grow together. The cow, yeah, cowberry tends to be more upright, um, as is the bearberry, as, as, as is the, um, the bilberry. <coughs> so those main ways. There are some other um, smaller scale differences. But, um, the berries on the bearberry are very dark, um, whereas on the cowberry they go red. Um, on the next page, we've got some club mosses. And these, they're not related to mosses. They're re more related to ferns, actually, and they're much tougher texture than mosses. And these, these four species we could find in the hills, in the heaths. Alpine club moss is the most distinct of them because it looks like it's bits of um, cypress. You know, there's, there's, uh, how cypresses have those very short leaves like scales, overlapping scales. Well, it's, you get that effect with alpine club moss and that kind of slight bluey grayish tinge is distinct as well. Um, low creeping plant, especially in short heath and short upland grassland vegetation. The um, fir club moss is really easy to tell because the shoots all arise, the branches all arise from a single point. So it's just a tuft of these, um, these different branches. Um, Stag's horn club moss, equally easy. It's more creeping and branched. And the leaves, each leaf ends in a long white hair point. Nothing else like that. The interrupted club moss, which is not a common plant, this is more scarce um, upland heathland plant, is similar to the stag's horn club moss, but the leaves don't have white hair points. That's the main difference. Its leaves are very similar to actually to the leaves of the fir club moss, but as you can see, the growth form of the plant is very different because the interrupted club moss um, sprawls around, it creeps, it's creeping and branched. Um, and so, yeah, those club mosses. And the next page has some um, herb species that we can find in, say, in these montane heaths. Mountain everlasting, very distinctive thing, very small. It's like kind of open places where there's a good amount of space. Being a little thing like that, it can't compete very well with tall, thick vegetation. Um, in flower, those little pale whitish to slightly pinky tinged heads are very distinct, but any time of year you can pick it out by those leaves that come in little tufts, little rosettes. They've got very pale whitish undersides and like the alpine ladies mantle, the whitish colour extends around the edges, so, you, so it's like they've been outlined uh, with a white pen. And the leaves are widest beyond the middle on a, as a whole, on the whole. Um, so that's the easy one to tell. Dwarf cornell, the leaves come in opposite pairs and one pair going on to the next pair further up the stem, they switch around at right angles so it looks like they're in crosses, in fours almost. And the leaves, individual leaves themselves, are a bit like dogwood leaves and it's related to dogwood. All the dogwoods are much bigger um, shrub that you get down south in hedges and woods. <clears throat> and, um, but that thing where the, the side veins never actually get right to the edge, they sort of curl back in, where you get that effect with the dwarf cornel as well. The flowers are kind of creamy white with a black middle. Um, I haven't got flowers in here, but we're seeing the beautiful pink colour that the leaves go in the autumn. It's not a common plant, it's very much a northern plant of uh, montane heaths and um, sometimes bits of bog as well. Cloudberry, similar places, northern um, heaths and bogs, but it does come down further south, down as far as northeast Wales, actually, there's some a site for it on the Berwyn Mountains. I've not seen it there, but I've heard about it being there. <clears throat> um, and it's related to, related to bramble, and it has flowers that look like bramble, and it has orange berries that you can eat. But the plant as a whole is quite different. It's not prickly, thankfully. Um, and these very wrinkled leaves that are um, lobed a bit like leaves of some kind of um, like a, a ribes, you know, the currants bushes or a sycamore leaf. You know. It does really stand out in these heathery heaths and heathery bogs in the northern uplands because the only thing that we get with leaves so broad and that particular texture, after the leaves have died down, 
in the autumn, they remain for quite a long time uh, in um, a brown colour, a sort of litter of them low down on the ground. So you can generally pick out that there's cloudberry around at other times of year as well. Um, oh, um, yeah, we're near the end now. And next page has got <coughs> the negative indicators in the um, heathland habitat. Um, birch and bracken and bramble are listed as such for, well, actually all of these listed as such for the dry heathland, like the non-montane heaths, um, but the first three aren't, which is not surprising because you don't get birch and bracken and bramble in the montane zone. One might uh, question whether you should regard birch as something negative in, in a heath given that a lot of the heaths, especially at lower altitudes, would naturally be how have been woodland and birch is one of the main species of tree that you would find in such places. And these days, of course, there are lots, there's lots of um, management to try to increase woodland cover for, for good reasons. Um, obviously, if you've got really wonderful heaths, we don't really want to lose those. So depending on what kind of heath it is, it could actually be a really good thing to have birch trees growing on it but in other places you might not want to. So it's not really always going to be right to say every bit of birch in any kind of bit of heath is bad news because that's not really true. Bracken, well, it's going to, it does spread understandably. That's why it's going to be in there because it, it has like, these underground, underground um, rhizomes and it can spread and spread into grasslands and into heaths. And so you can lose your amounts of some, some amount of those kind of habitats. Bramble, if, it, if it's not very grazed, um, bramble can do quite well because it's a very palatable species, funnily enough, to um, big herbivores, even though it's prickly. But um, you don't tend to get massive amounts of it in heaths anyway. It tends to prefer rather richer soil than that which, uh, uh, which supports a lot of heather and bell heather. But yeah, it, the, the very lower altitude examples, more, some of the more lowland heaths, you could get bits of bramble if it's not very grazed. Not sure if it would be really um, that much of a great threat because you wouldn't want too much grazing anyway. Otherwise, you're going to start losing out on your heather and bell heather and so on because uh, they're palatable. Okay, the next two species, stinging nettle and creeping thistle, they will be in there because they tend to do better where there's been some either eutrophication, that's what the nettle really likes. Um, or um, a combination of eutrophication and maybe ground disturbance like trampling. Um, but really, it's not very extensive, you know, way to, to find um, an awful lot of these effects in the heath to such a degree that you get a lot of nettle and creeping thistle. Um, not surprising, really, that it's not uh, that it's only limited because the conditions in these heaths are um, generally pretty nutrient poor anyway. But sometimes we do find local um, abundance of these plants, very localized. Maybe if there's some places where the animals are sheltering quite a lot, and there's dung and urine there having that effect. Or as I've said in the text, maybe if there's a dead sheep or a dead deer has died somewhere and uh, <clears throat> around that you get some local um, enrichment. So um, the, the, the nettle and the thistle, even though they, um, they will be listed as NPMS negative indicators for um, in, including in the montane zone, you won't really find them much in the montane zone. There's a comment here, would a dominance of bramble, oh I've lost the comment, it's gone now, I didn't see that. I don't know if that can come back up again. Maybe it can't. <laughs> Got it here, <laughs> Fuban. It's um, would a dominance of bramble suggest that the area would really do what very well succeeding into scrub and woodland mosaic with the heath? Oh, it totally would suggest that the habitat would naturally be be a um, woodland or scrub. And in that sense, it's you know like the birch. It could be considered as part of. Um, a uh, natural process leading towards woodland, towards something something more natural. So whether you see that negatively or not, I think should depend on the nature of the heath anyway. I think it's most likely to happen in some of the lowland heaths. And even though some of those lowland heaths can be pretty species poor, 
the very fact that it's a rare habitat in in the lowlands like southern england lowlands you know, is going to be one reason why it's understandable for people to want to maintain some of those areas of as heath rather than let them all sort of develop into scrub and, and woodland so <clears throat> even though heathland <clears throat> In those lowlands, heathland is not going to be the natural habitat. The fact we got it there and it has some ecological interest um, is probably fair enough to say, yeah, it's a good idea to prevent some of it from um, going in, in, into woodland to maintain that. that. Uh, someone's saying, doesn't Bracken suggest woodland habitat too? Uh, it, it does as a general rule, yeah. It's, um, it tends to be mainly in places where the soil is deep enough and the climate deep and rich enough and the climate's um, uh, decent enough for um, for woodland development and for it to probably probably been wooden at one point. So some something rather similar um, story there. Well, it's much more widespread though to find bracken creeping into heath. We we get that in places where you just don't get bramble uh, up in the uplands, um, but not montane, not not in the montane zone. But general upland heaths, it's very common to find an awful lot a uh, lot of bracken. And um, <clears throat> there's another question here, Ben. Um, I was going to leave it to the end, but it's, it kind of fits really well with this. These questions. So it's would highlands like the Lake District have as much heath if there had not been so much grazing and tree cutting in the long distant past? And if so, is heath a man-made environment? Then? To a large extent, it is a man-made environment. Yes, um, and there's. Um, uh, and, and and so a lot of it would uh, yeah most uh, most of the non-montane dry heath would be at least more scrubby um, than at present and um, and quite a lot of it would have been woodland. Um, although that doesn't necessarily mean to say that we should want it all to go back to woodland, because an awful lot of the heaths. Uh, the non-montane heaths have uh, got such a lot of ecological interest in them because they've developed over a long time in accordance with um, land management that's um, if it's me maybe, maybe grazing management it's not been too severe so natural processes are still playing a big role in how the vegetation develops and so they do have um, a lot of interest it's very different on grouse moors i have to say where everything's been more floristically and ecologically impoverished and um, it's a different story there. But most of the grass moor dry heath would have been um, woodland, at least some kind of scrubby woodland. And if people are saying maybe we should get some more woodland back in those places, yeah, um, that's um, very much on the cards, I think. And this carbon sequestration, yeah, very much they're good habitats for that because the heather, <clears throat> all that wool, all that woody growth, is a good um, a good carbon store. Um, and yeah, if you can get uh, in some places, if you've got have if you're going to have trees growing on there, then yeah, even more so. But even as it stands, the the heath is um, is, is a pretty decent carbon store. And the previous question in also involved grazing. So um, yeah, in some places heath has lost out and be turned into grassland as a result of um, heavy grazing, and that can be a bit of a problem because some of the heaths, there are some really wonderful heaths that have been losing ground because of um, too much grazing. You can see this has happened in a lot of the uplands of um, Wales and Northern England and the, um, the Lake Districts and the Southern Uplands, where there's been quite a long history of sheep grazing, pretty intensive sheep grazing. And the grassland that results from that can be really very species poor acid grassland that's of lower ecological interest than the heath that it could otherwise be so it's not good to have too much grazing um, in these in, in these these places and it has has led to some some losses uh, we're almost at the last page and one two more pages the next page um, which involves kind of slight repetition of what I've been saying already, like saying we've got cool, warm and happy heaths. What about sound heaths? I suppose you'll probably figure from what I've been saying that in my view, some of the burnt heaths are pretty sad heaths where it's artificially burned in this, in this way <coughs> for um, commercial reasons. Um, as I've said there, obviously the owner or manager of a grass mall will probably disagree with me about that. 
but at least I'm not the only person who um, is, is not happy about grass moor management uh, and overgrazing can um, can have pretty bad um, effects leading to um, depletion of some of the heath and uh, there's a view of some montane heath by the way at the bottom looking out across some big blanket bowls in Sutherland and the um, to try and take a happier view I don't know, <laughs> not wanting to end too negatively dwelling on problems of overgrazing and burning the last picture on the next page is a drawing I did of um, uh, mountain sylvan in the uh, northwest highlands the heath the, the further northwest you go some fantastic heath well actually down in the southwest these wonderful heaths with the wee little gorses and the yellow flowers and the across this coat is yeah in the far north there are different kinds of heath and these montane ones are um, wonderful things and someone's asking is bearberry preferentially grazed when it recovers quicker than heather post burning bearberry is not really very palatable um so um, they they tend to leave out the uh, the Arctic Staphylos universi. Yeah, that's not a palatable species. Um, so it it increases in abundance um, in those some of those places after there's been a burn. But then what happens is the heather gradually um, recolonizes. Well, it's not colonized; it's already there. It regrows, it gets taller and thicker, and eventually starts to outcompete that bearberry again and um, uh, and you, you end up with less and less bearberry and you go back towards the heath that's either a heather bell heather heath or a heather blaberry heath or a mixture of all three um, and you can get a kind of cycle going on that that way um, in relation to the burning um, regime um, but it's I think it's important to note as I mentioned earlier on that um, we don't absolutely need that in order to have good populations of bearberry because we get them naturally in places where rockiness or wind exposure to wind keep the heather at bay enough for that bearberry to um, maintain a good population in the long term and places actually in this view here near Sylvan around that sort of area in the far northwest is one place where the windiness um, that plays a part and so some of our finest more naturally occurring heaths with an awful lot of bearberry in them are along the northwestern seaboard <clears throat> um, in this picture the, the, there's a lot of dry heath on the distant slopes and the stuff in the um, foreground on the Louisian rocks there is a mixture of bits of dry heath and also wet heath and bogs hence that slightly more golden color in the um, late summer and autumn of the deer grass um, coloring the vegetation and showing up where there's more wet heath and bog compared with the dry heath so um, yep I hope that this has been, been worthwhile for you to be uh, uh, looking at and listening to over the last whatever it's been hour and a half or so um, and any further questions I'm happy to do my best to to answer and thank you I have to say thank you everybody for uh, being here uh, virtually and your your patience and interest okay uh, someone says thank you yes that's good it's, it's always nice to have good um good feedback <laughs> mm, so i'll i should um, just sorry ben there was just one question it was asked i do believe before you kind of covered this but just in case um it was still missed um, it's asking to heat to appear across the United, like across the whole of the United Kingdom, and can it happen at low and high altitudes? If if what can if heaths can you say again? Sorry, yeah, heaths in general. Um, does that habitat occur across the whole of the United Kingdom, and can they occur hmm. at low and high altitudes? Oh yeah, they do. They they um right across the UK, um, mostly greatest extent is um is in the uplands um in the lowlands they're much more patchy and there are pretty big areas of the lowlands where you'd be hard pressed to find any heath because the soils are wrong really you know, if you've got areas where the soils are a bit too damp and nutrient rich 
um, you're not going to get it. So it's places where, like in the southern lowlands, in the English lowlands, it's mostly, most of it says Dorset's lost 90% of its ETA. Yeah, you know, it's it's a it's a, a vulnerable habitat. Places where, where you've got maybe sandy soils that are inherently nutrient poor um, and reasonably well drained. Um, and a lot of the, so much of the habitat has been modified anyway by um, agriculture and forestation. So it's, it's most sparse and patchy in the lowlands. Um, but yeah, it is widespread. It's a, it, is, it is a very widespread habitat. Would you be able to just go into a bit more depth um, about the underlying rock types that are called heathlands, please? Underlying rock types, yeah. Um, in the uplands, you can get it on a wide range of, of rock types, mainly acid um, ones, but it can, if you've got a bit of peat um, that's developed over quite a wide range of rock types, you can get you can get heath on, on the on the upper surface of various kinds of more, more peaty soils. But in general, rock types that are more um, more acid, so and, and, and um, give a kind of more like in the lunes, instead of kind of sandy soil, some of those those sands down there. Um, you're not going to get it on limestones, um, chalk, those kind of things, unless in the far in the northwest you've got where damper climate has given a little bit of a more peaty cover to some of that um, limestone. And there you can get bits of dry heath and wet heath. Um, overlying some sand, some limestone in places. It's not very common really to find that. But it's a huge range of, um, of rock types. Basalt is a reasonably rich rock. You can get calcareous grasslands on basalt, but you can also get dry heaths, really extensive on, um, on basalt in the uplands, right through to granite, um, shales, grey wacky kind of you know, um, rocks huge range of rocks that are inherently not too calcareous really very, very uh, simplest answer i can probably give to that no yeah, that was great thank you um somebody's also asking sorry this isn't directly for you ben just if the sli slides will be shared so this recording will be online in the next few days on the mpms youtube channel and we also have the annotated presentations put on the NPMS website and other training resources. So yeah, you can read it again. Good. Um, don't I don't see any more coming in, but a lot of people really enjoyed your talk, Ben. They found it very enjoyable and educational, and they also really liked the mixture of the science as well as the stories and the poems. That's good to hear. <laughs> I always think of some, I don't know, some incorporation of uh, humour or art or, you know, human. Um, it's gone down very well here. A lot of people like that mix. That's good. Uh, very happy to get that feedback. Mm. Mm. Good. And so um, it's interesting to see these comments. Some of the ways by too fast for me to read. But, uh, mm. So there's one question mixed in here with these. Lovely comments. There's one here saying, so if there's one abiotic feature that primarily favours heath, is this acidity? You, yeah, I think it, it's generally um, pretty fundamental most time. I mean, here and there you can get some slightly more base enriched heaths, but nutrient poor, uh, probably over um, sheer acidity. I think. Um, Bit being nutrient poor as well is really important. So it's not it's not just one particular thing. They are inherently really nutrient poor habitats, even if the acidity varies a little bit. Um, and uh, prevention of uh, eutrophication and prevention of, um, of of tree growth. But yeah, nutrient nutrient poor, well drained basically mainly acid soils is the, the fundamental thing and not too grazed, otherwise it's going to be a grassland. That's great Ben, thank you. I can't see any more further questions. 
Um, but if anybody is going back through and thinks of something later, oh, somebody's just um, asking about eutrophication. Um, so, don't know if you want to explain that in a bit more depth, Ben. What eutrophication is? Eutrophication from um, we're increasing the nutrient levels. That can it can be. Um, can have obviously can have an effect um hence well, you know from animals um dung and urine and um agricultural runoff from nearby farmland but you know the places where where we find these heathland habitats it's not so common to find um you know uh, adjacent highly managed fertilized fields uh, that are leaching off them um runoff so that's not generally so much of a problem. Grazing animals and the kind of eutrophication you can get from that um, can have effect, but it, an effect, but it tends to be rather localized. And because the habitat is inherently so nutrient poor, and in the uplands, rain helping wash stuff away through, um, eutrophication is not um, such a major problem, I think, in the heaths compared with grazing and burning and other kinds of land use change, like afforestation. I suppose your like, at, uh, atmospheric nitrogen pollution would be more of an issue with your heathlands? Yeah, um, that can be in some upland habitats where you've got um, stuff that's blown, um, like rain deposited acidification, that has been found to affect certain aspects of upland vegetation like the mosses for example rachimitrium heaths on mountain tops <clears throat> where um, uh, the sort of airborne pollutants have contributed apparently to certain declines in, um, in, in some of the mosses and probably some of the lichens maybe as well um, and in those same places high concentrations of sheep and deer have um, produced a kind of eutrophication that's led to decreases in the rachimitrium moss and increases in the um, in certain grasses and starts to convert it from a rachimitrium moss heath into a, an acid grassland. That's not quite so common to see I think in the in the dwarf shrub heaths though it's quite possible that airborne pollutants and acid deposition over past years has or and nitrogen deposition in more current times um, ha is having some degree of effect, probably quite a subtle one. Some people reckon that millennia has increased uh, in relation to um, nitrogen um, increases. That's slightly more in the damper habitats. So, so it could be, it could be, yeah. I can't see any more questions in the question and answer or the chat. Um, but if anyone is watching this again later, um, drop the NPMS support an email and we can get that passed through to Ben and get you yeah. back the answer if we can't answer it ourselves. Yeah, happy to, you know, um, look at any other correspondence that comes subsequently. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Ben. That was very informative and enjoyable. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Good. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. OK, I'll say goodbye. Okay. Enjoy your day, guys. Bye. Bye.